We'll just see where it goes. It could go anywhere. I know. That's better than going nowhere. Ahsoka fully delivers on its promise in Episode 5, as Ahsoka revisits the past to confront her complicated feelings about her former master. The episode is fueled by nostalgia as writer and director Dave Filoni beautifully brings Star Wars The Clone Wars to live action, but it also understands the lessons from the original trilogy so often lost in more modern Star Wars stories. Lightsaber battles are at their best as a physical manifestation of emotional turmoil between heavily connected characters. I've heard that before. The lamp shading of Christensen's de-aging doesn't make up for the effect, but at least the movement in the episode keeps the uncanny valley from being too prominent. The duel between Ahsoka and Anakin quickly shows that Ahsoka has largely learned everything she needs about fighting with lightsabers from her master, but this is really a lesson about a fight with herself. All of the visuals in the world between worlds are gorgeous, creating the effect of fighting in a mystical planetarium. As Anakin cuts the ground out from under his former Padawan, she tumbles back into the Clone Wars and her younger body. Ahsoka has a tricky challenge in that the chemistry between Ahsoka and Anakin was built over years by voice actors Ashley Eckstein and Matt Lanta, and Christensen and Dawson are trying to channel it without actually being able to draw on the experience. Remarkably, Greenblatt, who plays the young Ahsoka and Christensen, seem to click better. I don't understand. That's your problem. Master! Even though Ahsoka was always meant to be very young in the early episodes of Star Wars The Clone Wars, seeing her played by an actual child makes the horror of the conflict even greater. The lightsaber swinging in the fog of war is less important than the resolution of battle, with Ahsoka holding the hand of a dying clone trooper and mourning the nature of their victory. Hayden Christensen is in the midst of a redemption arc for his work in the Star Wars prequels, but that journey started with Filoni and Lanta bringing new depth to the character and his fall to the dark side. Anakin's ribbing of Ahsoka about the difficulty of having a student gets to the heart of Ahsoka's deep conflict about training Sabine, and demonstrates a dark sense of humour that made Anakin work so well in The Clone Wars. The flickering effect transitioning from Anakin in his Clone Wars costume and the blue lightsaber to the silhouette of Darth Vader's is appropriately ominous, and builds to the real lesson Ahsoka needs to learn, that Anakin's sins are not her own. In the final duel with Anakin's red lightsaber, her choice of life isn't so much about deciding not to drown, but about finally confronting her fear that her master's darkness is within her. There's more than a bit of the transition between Gandalf the Grey and Gandalf the White in Ahsoka's costume change, putting her closer to the avatar of the light side of the Force that she's been connected to since meeting the daughter in Clone Wars. Ahsoka's also digging more into the non-combat applications of the Force, from reading the impression Sabine left on the map like John Smith in the Dead Zone, to communing with the Purgle in a gorgeous scene that calls back to both Star Wars Rebels and Ahsoka's introduction in Star Wars Tale of the Jedi. Unfortunately, the excellent material involving Ahsoka and Anakin is repeatedly interrupted with scenes with Hera searching for Ahsoka and Sabine, while trying to avoid getting into more trouble with the New Republic. The Senate Oversight Committee is going to determine if your command should be permanently suspended. Hera's plot throughout the season has consistently felt like exposition dumps punctuated by tie-ins to other shows. I think a better version of this episode wouldn't have shown her after the heart-wrenching mournful speech from Huang until Ahsoka is rescued. Ships flying over water has become a staple effect in Star Wars live action shows, and you don't need multiple scenes of it just to remind viewers about the existence of Canon Jarrus and make it clear that his and Hera's son Jason shares his talents with the Force. Those diversions are frustrating because the scenes with Ahsoka and Anakin are so good. Dawson also becomes less stiff in her betrayal of Ahsoka, whether it's how stricken she appears when she learns of Sabine's betrayal to the joking around as they venture off into the unknown. Having seen what became of her more emotionally free master, it's understandable that Ahsoka felt the need to overcompensate by adhering to Jedi stoicism. Hopefully, confronting the trauma of her past and learning to trust her judgement will allow her to strike a balance that will make the character feel more natural in the back half of the season. 
After a gorgeous and wonderful portrayal of the Pergo swimming into hyperspace, we'll presumably get back to Sabine next week and finally see what's become of Grand Admiral Thrawn and Ezra Bridger. Ahsoka shares the problem of many Star Wars live-action series wasting a bunch of time to get to the good stuff, but hopefully next week can build on the momentum without feeling too rushed. Ahsoka Tano confronts her fears and former master in episode 5 of Ahsoka, which taps into nostalgia for Star Wars The Clone Wars to strong effect. As the live-action series jumps into another galaxy, Dave Filoni seems to finally be recapturing the character dynamics that made the animated show so emotionally powerful. And if you like that video, why not check out more episode reviews of Ahsoka? And for everything else Star Wars, stick with IGN.